Pocampo was unshakable. He kept plugging for the barber shop over the whorehouse. If you think I'd rather have a haircut than a whore, you're crazy as a June bug, Jasper said. Newt and the Rainies left the more abstruse questions to others and spent most of their time trying to reckon the economics of a visit to town. The summer days were long and slow, the herd placid, the heat intense. Just having Ogallala to think about made the time pass quicker. Occasionally, one of the Rainies would ride over by Newt to offer some new speculation. Soupy says they take off their clothes, Ben Rainey said one day. Newt had once seen a Mexican girl who had pulled up her skirt to wade in the Rio Grande. She wore nothing under the skirt. When she noticed he was watching, she merely giggled. Often after that, he had slipped down to the river when nothing much was happening, hoping to see her cross again. But he never had. That one glimpse was all he had to go on when it came to naked women. He had run it through his mind so many times it was hardly useful. I guess that costs a bunch, he said. About a month's wages, Jimmy Rainey speculated. Late one afternoon, Dietz rode in to report that the Platte was only ten miles ahead. Everyone in camp let out a whoop. By God, I wonder which way town is, Soupy said. I'm ready to go. Call knew the men were boiling to get to town. Though he had brought happy news, Dietz himself seemed subdued. He had not been himself since Jake's hanging. You feeling poorly? Call asked. Don't like this north, Dietz said. It's good grazing country, Call remarked. Don't like it, Dietz said. The light's too thin. Dietz had a faraway look in his eye. It puzzled Call. The man had been cheerful through far harder times. Now Call would often see him sitting on his horse looking south across the long miles they had come. At breakfast sometimes Call would catch him staring into the fire the way old animals stared before they died, as if looking across into the other place. The look in Dietz's eyes unsettled Call so much that he mentioned it to Augustus. He rode over to the tent one evening. Gus was sitting on a saddle blanket, barefoot, trimming his corns with a sharp pocket knife. The woman was not in sight, but Call stopped a good distance from the tent so as not to disturb her. If you want to talk to me, you'll have to come a little closer, Augusta said. I ain't walking that far barefooted. Call dismounted and walked over to him. I don't know what's the matter with Dietz, he said. Well, Dietz is sensitive, Augusta said. Probably you hurt his feelings in your blunt way. I didn't hurt his feelings, Call said. I always try to be especially good to Dietz. He's the best man we got. Best man we've ever had, Augusta said. Maybe he's sick. No, Call said. I hope he ain't planning to leave us, Augustus said. I doubt the rest of us could even find the water holes. He says he don't like the north, Call said. That's all he'll say. I hear we strike the plat tomorrow, Augustus said. All the boys are ready to go off and catch social diseases. I know it, Call said. I'd just as soon miss this town, but we do need supplies. Let them boys go off and hoorah a little, Augusta said. It might be their last chance. Why would it be their last chance? Old Dietz might know something, Augusta said, since he's so sensitive. We might all get killed by Indians in the next week or two. I doubt that, Call said. You ain't much more cheerful than he is. No, Augusta said. He knew they were not far from Clara's house, a fact which made Lorena extremely nervous. What will you do with me? she had asked. Leave me in the tent when you go see her? No, ma'am, he said. I'll take you along and introduce you properly. You ain't just baggage, you know. Clara probably don't see another woman once a month. She'll be happy for feminine conversation. She may know what I am, though, Lorena said. Yes, she'll know you're a human being, Augusta said. You don't have to duck your head to nobody. Half the women in this country probably started out like you did, working in saloons. She didn't, Lorena said. I bet she was always a lady. That's why you wanted to marry her. Augustus chuckled. A lady can slice your jugular as quick as a Comanche, he said. Clara's got a sharp tongue. She tomahawked me many a time in the past. 
I'll be afraid to meet her then, Lorena said. I'll be afraid of what she'll say. Oh, she'll be polite to you, Augustus assured her. I'm the one that will have to watch my step. But no matter what he said, he couldn't soothe the girl's agitation. She felt she would lose him, and that was that. She offered her body. It was all she knew to do. Something in the manner of the offer saddened him, though he accepted it. In their embraces, she seemed to feel for a moment that he loved her. Yet soon afterward, she would grow sad again. You're worrying yourself into a sweat for nothing, he said. Clara's husband will probably live to be ninety-six, and anyway, she and I probably ain't got no use for one another now. I ain't got the energy for Clara. I doubt I ever did. At night, when she finally slept, he would sit in the tent, pondering it all. He could see the campfire. Whatever boys weren't night herding would be standing around it, swapping jokes. Probably all of them envied him, for he had a woman, and they didn't. He envied them back for they were carefree, and he wasn't. Once started, love couldn't easily be stopped. He had started it with Laurie, and it might never be stopped. He would be lucky to get again such easy pleasures as the men enjoyed, sitting around a campfire swapping jokes. Though he felt deeply fond of Lorena, he could also feel a yearning to be loose again and have nothing to do but win at cards. The next morning he left Lorena for a bit and fell in with Dietz. Dietz, have you ever spent much time wanting what you know you can't have? He asked, figuring to get the conversation off to a brisk start. Spect I've had a good life, Dietz said. Captain paid me a fair wage. I ain't been sick but twice. And one time was when I got shot over by the river. That ain't an answer to the question I asked, Augustus said. Wantin' takes too much time, Deet said. I'd rather be working. Yes, but what would you have if you could have what you really want right now? Deets trotted along for a bit before he answered. Be back on the river, he said. Hell, the Rio Grande ain't the only river, Augustus commented. But before they could continue the discussion, they saw a group of riders come over a ridge far to the north. Augusta saw at once that they were soldiers. Ah, God, we've found the cavalry, at least, he said. There were nearly forty soldiers. The ponies in the remuda began to nicker at the sight of so many strange horses. Call and Augustus loped out and met them a half mile away, for the herd was looking restive at the sight of the riders. The leader of the troop was a small man with a gray mustache who wore a captain's bars, he seemed irritated at the sight of the herd. It was soon plain that he was drunk. Beside him rode a large man in greasy buckskins, clearly a scout. He was bearded and had a wad of tobacco in his jaw. I'm Captain Weaver, and this is Dixon, our scout, the captain said. Where the hell do you men think you're taking these cattle? We thought we were headed for Montana, Augustus said lightly. Where are we, Illinois? Call was irritated with Gus. He would make a joke. No, but you'll wish you were if Red Cloud finds you, Captain Weaver said. You're in the middle of an Indian war. That's where you are. Why in hell would anybody think they wanted to take cattle to Montana, Dixon, the scout said. He had an insolent look. We thought it would be a good place to sit back and watch them shit, Augustus said. Insolence was apt to bring out the comic in him, as Call knew too well. We've heard there are wonderful pastures in Montana, Call said, hoping to correct the bad impression Gus was giving. There may be, but you cowpokes won't live to see them, Dixon said. Oh, well, Augusta said, we wasn't always cowpokes. We put in some twenty years fighting Comanches in the state of Texas. Don't these Indians up here fall off their horses like other Indians when you put a bullet or two in them? Some do, and some just keep coming, Captain Weaver said. I didn't come over here to talk all morning. Have you men seen any sign? Our scout didn't mention any, Call said, waving to Dietz. Oh, you got a nigger for a scout, Dixon said. No wonder you're lost. We ain't lost, Call said, annoyed suddenly, and that black man could track you across the coals of hell and bring you back on a pitchfork if we asked him to, Augustus added. What makes you think you can say things like that to us? Captain Weaver said, flushing with anger. 
Ain't it still a free country? Augustus asked. Who asked you to ride up and insult our scout? Dietz came loping up, and Cole asked him if he had seen Indian sign. None between here and the river, Dietz said. A pale-looking young lieutenant suddenly spoke up. I thought they went east, he said. We went east, Weaver said. Where do you think we've been for the last week? Maybe they went farther and faster, Augustus said. Indians usually do. From the looks of those nags you're riding, they could probably outrun you on foot. You're a damn impertinent man, Weaver said. Those Indians killed a buffalo hunter and a woman two days ago. Three weeks ago, they wiped out a family southeast of here. If you see them, you'll wish you'd kept your damn beeves in Texas. Let's go, Call said, abruptly turning his horse. We need horses, Captain Weaver said. Ours are about ridden down. Ain't that what I said that you thought was so impertinent, Augustus remarked. I see you've got extras, Weaver said. We'll take them. There's a man who sells horses west of Ogallala. You can buy some more there and send the army a bill. No, thanks, Call said. We like the ones we've got. I wasn't asking, Weaver said. I'm requisitioning your horses. Augustus laughed. Call didn't. He saw that the man was serious. We need them, Dixon said. We've got to protect this frontier. Augustus laughed again. Who have you protected lately, he asked. All you've told us about are people you didn't protect. I'm tired of talking, Weaver said. Go get the horses, Jim. Take a couple of men and pick out good ones. You can't have any horses, Call said. You have no authority to requisition stock from us. By God, I'll have those horses or I'll have your hides, Weaver said. Go get them, Jim. The young lieutenant looked very nervous, but he turned as if to ride over to the herd. Hold on, son. The argument ain't over, Augustus said. You'd defy an officer of the U.S. Army? Weaver asked. You're as close to that horse trader in Ogallala as we are, Call pointed out. Yes, but we're going the other way, Weaver said. You were headed this way when you spotted us, Augustus said. When'd you change your mind? Dixon, the big scout, was listening to the conversation with contempt in his expression. The contempt was as much for Weaver as for them. Captain Weaver turned to the young man. I gave you an order. These men are all bluff. They're just cowboys. Go get the horses. As the young man passed, Augustus reached down and caught his bridle. If you want them horses, why don't you go get them, he said. You're the captain. I call this treason, Weaver said. You men can be hung for treason. Call had been looking over the rest of the troop. Throughout his career in the Rangers, he had been bothered by how sluggishly the cavalry performed, and the troop he saw watching the proceedings looked more sluggish than most. Half the men had gone to sleep in their saddles the moment the column stopped, and the horses all looked as if they needed a month off on good grass. How far is Ogallala? Call asked. I'm not interested in Ogallala, Weaver said. I'm interested in Red Cloud. We don't know this Red Cloud, Augustus said. But if he's much of a war chief, you better hope you don't catch him. I doubt an Indian would even consent to eat them ponies you're riding. I never saw a worse-mounted bunch of men. Well, we've been out ten days, and it's none of your concern, Weaver said, trembling with indignation. Although Augustus was doing most of the talking, it was Call whom he looked at with hatred. Let's go, Call said. This is pointless talk. He saw that the little captain was keyed up to the point where it wouldn't take much to provoke him into an explosion. Jim, get them horses, Weaver said. No, Call said. You can't have our horses. And I'll give you some advice, too. Your troop's exhausted. If you was to find Indians, you'd be the one massacred, most likely. You don't just need fresh horses, you need fresh men. What I don't need is advice from a goddamn cowboy, Weaver said. We've fought Comanches and Kiowas and Mexican bandits for twenty years, and we're still here, Call said. You'd do well to listen. If I see you in town, I'll box your goddamn ears, Dixon said, addressing himself to Call. Call ignored the man. He turned and started to ride away. Augustus released the young lieutenant's bridle. Leave me that nigger, Weaver said. I've heard they can smell Indians. They're just red niggers anyway. No, Call said. I'd be afraid you'd mistreat him. They went to the wagon. When they turned to look, the cavalry troop was still sitting there. 
Reckon they'll charge? Augustus asked. Charge a cow herd? Call said. I wouldn't think so. Weaver's mad, but not that mad. They waited, but the cavalry merely sat on the ridge for a few minutes, and then turned and rode away. Chapter 84 That afternoon they crossed the Platte River just east of Ogallala and turned the herd northwest. From the slopes north of the river they saw the little collection of shacks and frame buildings that made up the town. The cowboys were so entranced by the sight that they could hardly keep their minds on their business long enough to drive the cattle to a good bed ground. Call tried to caution them a little, mentioning that there were said to be Indians on the rampage, but the men scarcely heard him. Even Dish Boggett was in a fever to go. Call let six men go in first, Dish, Soupy, Bert, Jasper, Needle, and the Irishman. They all put on fresh shirts and raced away as if a hundred Comanches were after them. Augustus, setting up his tent, stopped a moment to watch them run. The cowboys whooped and waved their hats as they raced. Look at em go, Lori, Augustus said. Can't wait to get to town. Lorena was uninterested. She had only one thing on her mind. When are you going to see her, she asked. Oh, tomorrow will do, Augustus said. We'll both go. I'll stay here, Lorena said. I'd be too scared of what you'd say. Her hands were shaking at the thought of the woman, but she helped Gus peg the tent. I've a mind to go to Ogallala myself, Augusta said. Would you like to come? Why do you want to? she asked. Well, it's a town of sorts, he said. I've a mind to do something civilized, like eat dinner in a restaurant. If that's asking too much, I could at least go in a bar room and drink a glass of whiskey. Come with me, he added. They've probably got a store or two. We could buy you some clothes. Lorena considered it. She had been wearing men's clothes since Gus rescued her. There hadn't been any place to buy any others. She would need a dress if she went with Gus to see the woman, but she didn't know if she really wanted to go see her, although she had built up a good deal of curiosity about her. Lots of curiosity, but more fear. It was a strange life, just staying in the tent and talking to no one but Gus, but she was used to it. The thought of town frightened her almost as much as the thought of the woman. Do you want a whore or what? she asked when she saw him getting ready to go to town. Why would I want a whore when I've got you? he asked. You women folk have got strange minds. What I'd mainly like to do is sit in a chair and drink whiskey. I wouldn't mind a hand or two of cards either. You want that other woman and you've got me, Lorena said. You could want us both and a whore too, I guess. Go get one if you want. I don't care. She almost hoped he would. It would strengthen her case against the other woman. Come with me, Augustus said. I'll buy you some new dresses. Just buy me one yourself, Lorena said. Buy one you like. But I don't know your size, he said. Why are you so shy of towns? There ain't a soul in that town who's ever met you. She wouldn't go, so he gave up asking her and went himself, stopping at the wagon a minute to make sure Pocampo would take her her food. Call was there, looking restless. Since most of the experienced hands were gone, he had decided to stay with the herd and buy supplies tomorrow once some of them got back. The herd was grazing peacefully on the rolling slopes. The hands who were left, boys mostly, looked melancholy at the thought of the opportunities they were missing. Come ride to town with me, Augustus said to Call. This place is quiet as a church on Monday. I'll buy you a meal and we can sit and talk philosophy. No, I'll stay, Call said. I don't know a philosophy. Your philosophy is to worry too much, Augusta said. Jake would have gone with me quick enough if we hadn't hung him. Damn it, he brought it on himself, Call said. I know that. But when I spot a town, I remember what a fine companion he was around supper time, Augusta said. He loped the five or six miles to Ogallala, feeling rather strange, for it had just hit him how much he did miss Jake Spoon. Many a time, returning from a scout on the Brazos, they had raced into Austin together and divided the night between whiskey, cards, and women. Clara and Call would both be stiff with them for a week after such a carouse. 
Clara, if anything, softened slower than call. Now Jake was gone and Clara near. It seemed to him he might be wise not to go see her, just trail on into Montana and let the past be past. No woman had affected his heart in the way she had. The memory was so sweet he was almost afraid to threaten it by seeing what Clara had become. She might have become a tyrant. She had that potential even as a girl. Or she might have become merely a worked-out, worn-down pioneer woman, her beauty gone and her spirit tamed. He might look at her and not feel a thing, in which case he would lose something he treasured. On the other hand, he might look at her and feel all that he had felt in their younger days, in which case riding off and leaving her wouldn't be very easy. Then there was Lorena. In the last weeks she had proved sweeter than any woman he had known, more responsive than his wives, kinder than Clara. Her beauty had flowered again. The cowboys were always thinking of excuses to ride within twenty or thirty yards of them so they could get a glimpse of it. He ought to consider himself lucky, he knew. Everyone in the outfit, with the possible exception of Call, considered him lucky. He ought to let the past keep its glow and not try to mix it with what he had in the present. But then he knew he could not simply ride by Clara, whatever the threat of turmoil or disappointment. Of all the women he knew, she had meant the most, and was the one person in his life he felt he had missed in some ways. He remembered what she had said when she told him she was going to marry Bob, that she would want his friendship for her daughters. He would at least go and offer it. Besides, it would be interesting to see if the girls were like their mother. To his surprise, he didn't enjoy the visit to Ogallala very much. He hit the dry goods store just as the owner was closing and persuaded him to reopen long enough for him to buy Laurie a mass of clothes. He bought everything from petticoats to dresses, a hat, and also a warm coat, for they were sure to strike cool weather in Montana. He even bought himself a black frock coat worthy of a preacher and a silk string tie. The merchant soon was in no mood to close. He offered Augustus muffs and gloves and felt-lined boots and other oddities. In the end, he had such a purchase that he couldn't even consider carrying it. They would have to come in tomorrow and pick it up in the wagon, though he did wrap up a few things in case Lori wanted to wear them to Clara's. He bought her combs and brushes and a mirror. Women liked to see themselves, he knew, and Lorena hadn't had the opportunity since Fort Worth. The one hotel was easy to find, but the restaurant in it was a smoky little room with no charm and only one diner, a somber man with mutton-chop whiskers. Augustus decided he would prefer a cheerful bar, but that proved not easy to find. He went into one that had a huge rack of elk horns over the door and a clientele consisting mostly of mule skinners who hauled freight for the army. None of the Hat Creek outfit was there, though he had seen a couple of their horses tied outside. They had probably gone straight to the whorehouse next door, he concluded. He ordered a bottle and a glass, but the boisterous mule skinners made so much racket he couldn't enjoy his drinking. A middle-aged gambler with a thin mustache and a greasy cravat soon spotted him and came over. You look like a man who could tolerate a game of cards, the gambler said. My name is Shaw. Two-handed gambling don't interest me, Augustus said. Anyway, it's too rackety in here. It's hard work just getting drunk when things are this loud. This ain't the only whiskey joint in town, Mr. Shaw said. Maybe we could find one that's quiet enough for you. Just then a girl walked in, painted and powdered. Several of the mule skinners whooped at her, but she came over to where Augustus sat. She was skinny and could hardly have been more than seventeen. Now, Nellie, leave us be, the gambler said. We were about to go have a game. Before the girl could answer, one of the mule skinners at the next table toppled backwards in his chair. He had gone to sleep with the chair tilted back, and he fell to the floor, to the amusement of his peers. The fall did not wake him. He sprawled on the saloon floor, dead drunk. Oh, go along, Shaw, the girl said. There ain't but two of you. What kind of game would that be? I made that point myself, Augustus said. A bartender came over, got the drunk man by the collar, and drug him out the door. Want to go next door, mister? Nellie asked. The gambler, to Augustus's surprise, suddenly cuffed the girl. It was not a hard blow, but it surprised and embarrassed her. 
Now, here, Augusta said. There's no excuse for that. The young lady was talking perfectly polite. She ain't a lady, she's a tot. And I won't have her interfering with our pleasure, the gambler said. Augusta stood up and pulled out a chair for Nellie. Sit down, miss, he said. Then he turned to the gambler. You scoot, he said. I don't gamble with men who mistreat women. The gambler had a ferret-like expression. He ignored Augustus and glared at the girl. What have I told you, he said. You'll get a beating you won't forget if you interfere with me again. The girl trembled and seemed on the verge of tears. I won't have a slut interrupt in my play, the gambler said. Augustus hit the man in the chest so hard that he was knocked back onto the next table amid three or four mule skinners. The mule skinners looked up in surprise. The gambler had the wind knocked out of him so thoroughly that he waved his arms in the air, his mouth open, afraid he would die before he could draw another breath. Augustus paid him no more attention. The girl, after a moment, sat down, though she kept glancing nervously toward the gambler. A big mule skinner shoved him unceremoniously off the table, and he was now on his hands and knees, still trying to get his breath. He ain't hurt, Augustus assured the girl. Would you like a sip of whiskey? Yeah, the girl said, and when the bartender brought a glass, quaffed the whiskey Augustus poured her. She couldn't keep her eyes off the gambler, though. He had managed to breathe again and was standing by the bar, holding his chest. Have you had trouble with that fellow before? Augustus asked. He's Rosie's husband, Nellie said. Rosie is the woman I work for. They don't get along. Rosie sends me out and he runs me off. She tried to recover from her fright and to look alluring, but the attempt was so pathetic that it saddened Augustus. She looked like a frightened young girl. Rosie ain't nice to work for, she said. Do you want to go next door? I got to do something quick. If Shaw complains, she'll whoop me. Rosie's meaner than Shaw. I'd say you need to change bosses, Augustus said. As soon as he put more whiskey in her glass, the girl quaffed it. There ain't but one other madam, and she's just as bad, Nellie said. You sure you won't come next door? I got to find a customer. I guess you better bribe that gambler, if that's the situation, Augusta said. Give him five and Rosie five and keep the rest for yourself. He handed her twenty dollars. The girl looked surprised, but took the money and quaffed another whiskey. Then she went up to the bar and had the bartender change the money for her. Soon she was talking to Shaw as if nothing had happened. Depressed, Gus bought a bottle to take with him and left town. The moon was full and the prairie shadowy. P.I. was attempting to sing to the cattle, but his voice was nothing to compare to the Irishman's. To his surprise, Augustus saw that Lorena was sitting outside the tent. Usually she stayed inside. When he dismounted, he bent to touch her and found that her cheek was wet. She had been sitting there crying. Why, Laurie, what's the matter? he asked. I'm afraid of her, she said simply. Her voice sounded thick with discouragement. I'm afraid she'll take you. Augustus didn't try to reason with her. What she felt was past reason. He had caused it by talking too freely about the woman he had once loved. He unsaddled and sat down beside her on the grass. I thought you went to her. She said, I didn't believe you went to town. Ain't the moon beautiful, he said. These plains seem like fine country under a full moon. Lorena didn't look up. She wasn't interested in the moon. She only wanted it to be settled about the woman. If Gus was going to leave, she wanted to know it, although she couldn't imagine a life if that happened. Did you ever like to sing, he asked, trying to get her to talk about something else. She didn't answer. I think it must be a fine gift, singing, he said. If I could sing like the Irishman, I would just ride around singing all day. I might get a job in a bar room like Lippy used to have. Lorena didn't want to talk to him. She hated the way she felt. Better if something happens and kills us both, she thought. At least I wouldn't have to be alone. Chapter 85 Newt, the Rainy Boys, and P.I. got to go into town the next afternoon. The fact that the first group drug back in ones and twos, looking horrible, in no way discouraged them. 
Jasper Fant had vomited all over his horse on the ride out, too beaten to dismount or even to lean over. You are a sorry sight, Pocampo said sternly when Jasper rode in. I told you it would be that way. Now all your money is gone and all you feel is pain. Jasper didn't comment. Needle Nelson and Soupy Jones rode in next. They looked no different from Jasper, but at least their horses were clean. It's a good thing there's no more towns, Needle said when he dismounted. I don't think I'd survive another town. If that's the best Nebraska can do, I pass, Soupy said. After hearing all the reports, which merely confirmed his suspicions, Poe Campo was reluctant to let Augustus borrow the wagon. Towns are full of thieves, he argued. Somebody might steal it. If they do, they'll have to steal it with me sitting in it, Augustus said. I'd like to see the thief who could manage that. He had promised Lippy a ride to town. Lippy had grown homesick for his old profession and hoped at least to hear some piano music on his visit. Call decided to ride in and help with the provisioning. He was trying to make an inventory of things they needed and the fact that Pocampo was in a cranky, uncooperative mood didn't make things any easier. It's summertime, Poe said. We don't need much. Buy a water barrel and we'll fill it in the river. It is going to get very dry. What makes you think it's going to get dry? Augustus asked. It will get dry, Pocampo insisted. We will be drinking horses' blood if we're not lucky. I think I must have drunk some last night, Jasper said. I never got sick enough to puke on my horse before. Newt and the other boys raced to town, leaving P.I. far behind. But once they got there, they felt somewhat at a loss as to what to do first. For an hour or two, they merely walked up and down the one long street looking at the people. None of them had actually been in a building in such a while that they felt shy about going in one. They stared in the window of a big hardware store but didn't go in. The street itself seemed lively enough. There were plenty of soldiers in sight and men driving wagons and even a few Indians. Of whores, they saw none. The few women on the street were just matrons doing their shopping. The town abounded in saloons, of course, but at first the boys were too spooked to go in one. Probably they would be looked at because of their age, and anyway they didn't have funds for drinking. What little they had must be saved for whores, at least that was their intention. But the fourth or fifth time they passed the big general store, their intentions wavered, and they all slipped in for a look at the merchandise. They stared at the guns, buffalo rifles and pistols with long blue barrels, and far beyond their means. All they came out with was a sack of whorehound candy. Since it was the first candy any of them had had in months, it tasted wonderful. They sat down in the shade and promptly ate the whole sack. I wish the captain would fill the wagon with it, Ben Rainey said. The opportunity existed, for Augustus was just driving up to the dry goods store in the wagon, and the captain rode beside him on the hell bitch. Why, he won't let us fill it with candy, Jimmy Rainey said. Nonetheless, feeling bolder and more experienced, they went back in the store and bought two more sacks. Let's save one for Montana, Newt said. There might not be no more towns. But his cautions fell on deaf ears. Pete Spettle and the others consumed their share of the candy with dispatch. While they were finishing it, they saw Dish Boggett come walking around the side of a saloon across the street. Let's ask him where the whores are, Ben suggested. I doubt we can find any by ourselves. They caught up with Dish by the livery stable. He didn't look to be in high spirits, but at least he was walking straight, which was more than could be said for the men who had returned to camp. What are you sprouts doing in town, he asked. We want a whore, Ben said. Go around to the back of that saloon then, Dish said. You'll find plenty. Dish now rode a fine little mare he called Sugar. In disposition, she was the opposite of the hell bitch. She was almost like a pet. Dish would take tidbits from his plate and feed them to her by hand. He claimed she had the best night vision of any horse he had ever seen, in all their stampedes, she had never stepped in a hole. He delighted in her so much that he always gave her a brushing before he saddled her, keeping a little horse brush in his saddlebag just for that purpose. How much do they cost? Jimmy Rainey asked, referring to the whores. The thought that some were only a few steps away made them all a little nervous. It depends on how long you intend to stay upstairs, Dish said. 
I met a nice one named Mary, but they ain't all like her. There's one they call the Buffalo Heifer. Somebody would have to offer me a month's wages before I'd get near her. But I expect she'd do for you, Sprouts. You can't expect top quality your first time off. As they were talking, a party of some half-dozen soldiers came riding up the street, led by the big scout, Dixon. There come them soldiers again, Newt said. Dish hardly glanced at the soldiers. I guess the rest of them got lost. He had brushed sugar and was just preparing to saddle her when the scout and the soldiers suddenly trotted over their way. Newt felt nervous. He knew there had almost been serious trouble with the soldiers. He glanced at the captain and Mr. Gus, who were loading a water barrel into the wagon. Evidently, they had decided to take Pocampo's advice. Dixon, who looked ungodly big to Newt, rode his black gelding practically on top of Dish Boggett before he stopped. Dish, cool as ice, put the saddle blanket on the mare and paid him no mind. How much for the filly? Dixon asked. She's got a stylish look. Not for sale, Dish said, reaching down for his saddle. As he stooped, Dixon leaned over him and spat a stream of tobacco juice on the back of Dish's neck. The brown juice hit Dish at the hairline and dripped down under the collar of his loose shirt. Dish straightened up and put his hand to his neck. When he saw the tobacco juice, his face flushed. You darn cowboys are too fond of your horses, Dixon said. I'm fair tired of being told your ponies ain't for sale. This one ain't for damn sure. And anyway, you won't be in no shape to ride when I get through with you, Dish said, barely controlling his voice. I'd hate to think I'd let a man spit on me and then ride off. Dixon spat again. This time, since Dish was facing him, the juice hit him square in the breast. Dixon and the soldiers all laughed. Are you going to dismount, or will you require me to come and drag you off that pile of soap bones you're riding? Dish asked, meeting the big man's eye. Well, ain't you a tomcat, Dixon said, grinning. He spat at Dish again, but Dish ducked the stream of tobacco juice and leaped for the man. He meant to knock the scout off the other side of the horse, but Dixon was too strong and too quick. Though no one had seen it, he held a long-barreled pistol in his off hand, and when Dish grappled with him, he used it like a club, hitting Dish twice in the head with the butt. To Newt's horror, Dish crumpled without a sound. He slid down the side of Dixon's horse and flopped on his back on the ground. Blood poured from a gash over his ear, staining his dark hair. His hat fell off, and Newt picked it up, not knowing what else to do. Dixon stuffed his pistol back in its holster. He spat once more at Dish and reached to take the filly's reins. He reached down, undid the girth, and dumped Dish's saddle on the ground. "'That'll teach you to sass me, cowboy,' he said. Then he glanced at the boys. "'He can send the bill for this mare to the U.S. Army,' Dixon said. "'That is, if he ever remembers there was a mare when he wakes up.' Newt was all but paralyzed with worry. He had seen the pistol butt strike Dish twice, and for all he knew, Dish was dead. It had happened so quickly that Ben Rainey still had his hands in the sack of candy. All Newt knew was that the man mustn't be allowed to take Dish's horse. When Dixon turned to trot away, he grabbed the bridle bit and hung on. Sugar, pulled two different ways, tried to rear, almost lifting Newt off the ground, but he hung on. Dixon tried to jerk the horse loose, but Newt had both hands on the bit now and wouldn't let go. Damn, these cowboys are pests, Dixon said. Even the pups. The soldier next to him had a rawhide quirt hanging from his saddle horn. Dixon reached over and got it, and without another word, rode close to the mare and began to lash Newt with it. Pete Spettle, anger in his face, leaped in and tried to get the quirt, but Dixon backhanded him and Pete went down. It turned out his nose was broken. Newt tried to hunker close to the mare. At first, Dixon was mainly quirting his hands to make him turn loose, but when that was unsuccessful, he began to hit Newt wherever he could catch him. One whistling blow cut his ear. He tried to duck his head, but Sugar was scared and kept turning, exposing him to the quirt. Dixon began to whip him on the neck and shoulders. Newt shut his eyes and clung to the bit. Once he glanced at Dixon and saw the man smiling. He had cruel eyes, like a boar pig's. Then he ducked, for Dixon attempted to cut him across the face, 
The blow hit Sugar instead, causing the horse to rear and squeal. It was the squeal that caught Call's attention. After loading the heavy oak water barrel, he and Augustus had stepped back into the store a minute. Augustus was contemplating buying a lighter pistol to replace the big colt he carried, but he decided against it. He carried out some of the things he had bought for Lorena, and Call took a sack of flour. They heard the horse squeal while they were still in the store, and came out to see Dixon quirting Newt as Dish Boggett's mare turned round and round. Two cowboys lay on the ground, one of them Dish. I thought that son of a bitch was a bad one, Augustus said. He pitched the goods in the wagon and drew his pistol. Call dropped the sack of flour onto the tailgate and quickly swung onto the hell bitch. Don't shoot him, he said. Just watch the soldiers. He saw Dixon again savagely quirt the boy across the back of the neck, and anger flooded him, of a kind he had not felt in many years. He put spurs to the hell bitch, and she raced down the street and burst through the surprised soldiers. Dixon, intent on his quirting, was the last to see Call, who made no attempt to check the hell bitch. Dixon tried to jerk his mount out of the way at the last minute, but his nervous mount merely turned into the charge, and the two horses collided. Call kept his seat, and the hell bitch kept her feet, but Dixon's horse went down, throwing him hard in the process. Sugar nearly trampled Newt, trying to get out of the melee. Dixon's horse struggled to its feet, practically underneath Sugar. There was dust everywhere. Dixon sprang up, not hurt by the fall, but disoriented. When he turned, Call had dismounted and was running at him. He didn't look large, and Dixon was puzzled that the man would charge him that way. He reached for his pistol, not realizing he still had the quirt looped around his wrist. The quirt interfered with his draw, and Call ran right into him just as his horse had run into Dixon's horse. Dixon was knocked down again, and when he turned his head to look up, he saw a boot coming at his eye. You wouldn't he said, meaning to tell the man not to kick, but the boot hit his face before he could get his words out. The six soldiers watching were too astonished to move. The small-seeming cowman kicked Dixon so hard in the face that it seemed his head would fly off. Then the man stood over Dixon, who spat out blood and teeth. When Dixon struggled to his feet, the smaller man immediately knocked him down again and then ground his face into the dirt with a boot. He's going to kill him, one soldier said, his face going white. He's going to kill Dixon. Newt thought so, too. He had never seen such a look of fury as was on the captain's face when he attacked the big scout. It was clear that Dixon, though larger, had no chance. Dixon never landed a blow, or even tried one. Newt felt he might get sick just seeing the way the captain punished the man. Dish Boggett sat up, holding his head, and saw Captain Call dragging the big scout by his buckskin shirt. The fight had carried a few yards down the street to a blacksmith shop with a big anvil sitting in front of it. To Dish's astonishment, the captain straddled Dixon and started banging his head against the anvil. He'll kill him, he said out loud, forgetting that a few moments before he too had wanted to kill the scout. Then he saw Augustus run over, mount the hell bitch, and take down Call's rope. Augustus trotted the few steps to the blacksmith shop and dropped a loop over Call's shoulders. Then he turned the horse away, took a wrap around the saddle horn, and began to ride up the street. Call wouldn't turn loose of Dixon at first. He hung on and dragged him a few feet from the anvil. But Augustus kept the rope tight and held the horse in a walk. Finally, Call let the man drop, though he turned with a black wild look and started for whoever had roped him, not realizing who the man was. The skin was torn completely off his knuckles from the blows he had dealt Dixon, but he was lost in his anger, and his only thought was to get the next assailant. It was in him to kill. He didn't know if Dixon was dead, but he would make sure of the next man. Woodrow, Augustus said sharply as Call was about to leap for him. Call heard his name and saw his mare. Augustus walked toward him, loosening the rope. Call recognized him and stopped. He turned to look at the six soldiers, all on their horses nearby, silent and white-faced. He took a step toward them and threw the rope off his shoulders. 
Woodrow, Augustus said again. He took out his big colt, thinking he might have to hit Call to stop him from going for the soldiers. But Call stopped. For a moment, nothing moved. Augustus dismounted and looped the rope over the saddle horn. Call was still standing in the street getting his breath. Augustus walked over to the soldiers. Get your man and go, he said quietly. Dixon lay by the anvil. He had not moved. Reckon he's dead? a sergeant asked. If he ain't, he's lucky, Augustus said. Call walked down the street and picked up his hat, which had fallen off. The soldiers rode slowly past him. Two dismounted and began to try to load Dixon on his horse. Finally, all six dismounted. The man was so heavy it took all of them to get him up and draped over his horse. Call watched. At the sight of Dixon, his anger threatened to rise again. If the man moved, Call was ready to go for him again. But Dixon didn't move. He hung over his horse, blood dripping off his head and face into the dust. The soldiers mounted and slowly led the horse away. Call looked and saw Dish Boggett sitting on the ground by his saddle. He walked slowly over to him. Dish had a gash behind his ear. Are you much hurt? he asked. No, Captain, Dish said. Guess I'm too hard-headed. Call looked at Newt. There were welts beginning to form on his neck and one of his cheeks. A little blood showed in a cut on his ear. Newt was still tightly gripping Sugar's bit, a fact which Dish noticed for the first time. He stood up. You hurt? Call asked the boy. No, sir, Newt said. He just quirted me a little. I wasn't going to let him have Dish's horse. Well, you can let her go now, Dish said. He's gone. I'm much obliged to you for what you did, Newt. Newt had gripped the bit so tightly that it was painful to let go. It had cut deep creases in his palms, and he seemed to have squeezed the blood out of his fingers. But he turned the mare loose. Dish took the reins and patted her on the neck. Augustus walked over and stooped down by Pete Spettle, who was blowing frothy blood out of his broken nose. "'I better take you to the doctor,' Augustus said. "'Don't want no doc,' Pete said." My God, this is a hard-headed lot, Augustus said, walking over to Ben Rainey. He took the candy sack and helped himself to a piece. Hardly a one of you will take good advice. Call mounted the hell bitch, slowly recoiling his rope. Several townspeople had witnessed the fight. Most were still standing there, watching the man on the gray mare. When he had his rope fixed again, Call rode over to Augustus. Will you bring the grub, he asked. Yep. Augustus said, I'll bring it. Call saw that everyone was looking at him, the hands and cowboys and townspeople alike. The anger had drained out of him, leaving him feeling tired. He didn't remember the fight particularly, but people were looking at him as if they were stunned. He felt he should make some explanation, though it seemed to him a simple situation. I hate a man that talks rude, he said. I won't tolerate it. With that he turned and rode out of town. The people watching kept quiet. Rough as the place was, accustomed as they all were to sudden death, they felt that they had seen something extraordinary, something they would rather not have seen. My lord, Gus, Dish said as he watched the captain leave. Like the others, he was awed by the fury he had seen erupt in the captain. He had seen men fight many times, but not like that. Though he himself hated Dixon, it was still disturbing to see him destroyed, not even with a gun either. Have you ever seen him like that before? he asked Augustus. Once, Augustus said. He killed a Mexican bandit that way once before I could stop it. The Mexican had cut up three white people, but that wasn't what prompted it. The man scorned Call. He took another piece of candy. It don't do to scorn W.F. Call, he said. Was it me? Newt asked, feeling that maybe he should have managed things better. Was it just that he was quirting me? That was part of it, Augustus said. Call don't know himself what the rest of it was. Why, he'd have killed that man if you hadn't roped him, Dish said. He would have killed anybody. Anybody. Augustus, eating his candy, did not dispute it. Chapter 86 
It was because of the fight that the boys ended up amid the horrors. Dish saddled and left, and Augustus finished loading the wagon and started out of town. When he turned the wagon around, Newt and the Rainies were talking to P.I., who had been up the street getting barbered, and had missed the fight. P.I. had so much toilet water on that Augustus could smell him from ten feet away. He and the boys were standing around the bloody anvil, and the boys were explaining the matter to him. P. didn't seem particularly surprised. Well, he's a fighter, the captain, he said mildly. He'll box em if they get him riled. Box, Ben Rainey said. He didn't box. He run over the man with a horse and then near kicked his head off when he had him laying on the ground. Oh, that's boxing to the captain, P.I. said. Augustus stopped the wagon. You boys aim to linger around here, he asked. The boys looked at one another. The fight had startled them so that they had more or less forgotten their plans not that they had many. Well, it's our only chance to see the town, Newt said, thinking Augustus was going to tell them to go back to the wagon. That was not Augustus's intention. He had four ten-dollar gold pieces in his pocket, which he had intended to slip the boys on the sly. With call gone, that was unnecessary. He flipped one to Newt, then handed them to each of the other boys. This is a bonus, Augustus said. It's hard to enjoy a metropolis like this if you've got nothing but your hands in your pockets. Hell, if you're giving away money, give me some, Gus, P.I. said. No, you'd just spend it on barbers, Augustus said. These boys will put it to better use. They deserve a frolic before we set out to the far north. He popped the team with the reins and rode out of town, thinking how young the boys were. Age had never mattered to him much. He felt that, if anything, he himself had gained in ability as the years went by. Yet he became a little wistful, thinking of the boys. However he might best them, he could never stand again where they stood, ready to go into a whorehouse for the first time. The world of women was about to open to them. Of course, if a whorehouse in Ogallala was the door they had to go through, some would be scared back to the safety of the wagon and the cowboys. But some wouldn't. The boys stood around the blacksmith's shop, talking about the money Augustus had given them. In a flash, all the calculating they had done for the last few weeks was rendered unnecessary. They had means right in their hands. It was a dizzying feeling, and a little frightening. Ten dollars is enough for a whore, ain't it? Ben Rainey asked P.I. Ain't priced none lately, P.I. said. It irked him that he had gone to the barber shop at the wrong time and missed the fight. Why not, P? Newt asked. He was curious. All the other hands had rushed in to the whores. Even Dish had done it, and Dish was said to be in love with Lorena. Yet P was unaffected by the clamor. Even around the campfire he kept quiet when the talk was of women. P was one of Newt's oldest friends, and it was important to know what P felt on the subject. But P was not forthcoming. Oh, I mostly just stay with the wagon, he said, which was no answer at all. Indeed, while they were standing around getting used to having money to spend, P got his horse and rode off. Except for Lippy and the Irishman, they were the only members of the Hat Creek outfit left in town. Still, none of the boys felt bold enough just to go up the back stairs, as Dish had instructed them. It was decided to find Lippy, who was known to be a frequenter of whores. They found him standing outside a saloon, looking very disappointed. There's only one pioneer in this town, and it's broke, he said. A mule skinner busted it. I rode all this way in and ain't got to hear a note. What do you know about whores? Jimmy Rainey asked. He felt he couldn't bear much more frustration. Well, that's a dumb question, Lippy said. You do like the bull does with the heifer, only front ways if you want to. Instead of clarifying matters, that only made them more obscure, at least to Newt. His sense of the mechanics of whoring was vague at best. Now Lippy was suggesting that there was more than one method, which was not helpful to someone who had yet to practice any method. Yeah, but do you just ask? he inquired. We don't know how much it costs. Oh, that varies from gal to gal or madam to madam, Lippy said. Gus gave Lorena fifty dollars once, but that price is way out of line. Then he realized he had just revealed something he was not supposed to tell, and to boys, too. 
Boys were not reliable when it came to keeping secrets. I oughtn't to told that, he said. Gus threatened to shoot another hole in my stomach if I did. We won't tell, Newt assured him. Yes, you will, Lippy said. He was depressed anyway, because of the piano situation. He loved music, and had felt sure he would get to play a little, or at least listen to some in Ogallala. Yet the best he had done so far was a bartender with a harmonica, and he couldn't play that very well. Now he had really messed up and told Gus's secret. Then, in a flash of inspiration, it occurred to him that the best way out of that tight spot was to get the boys drunk. They were young and not used to drinking. Get them drunk enough and they might forget Ogallala entirely, or even Nebraska. They certainly would not be likely to remember his chance remark. He saw that the strongest thing they had treated themselves to so far was whorehound candy. Of course you boys are way too sober to be visiting whores, he said. You've got to beer up a little before you attempt the ladies. Why? Newt asked. Though he knew whores were often to be found in saloons, he wasn't aware that being drunk was required of their customers. Oh, yeah, them girls is apt to be rank, Lippy assured them. Hell, they wallow around with buffalo hunters and such like. You want to have plenty of alcohol in you before you slip up on one. Otherwise, you'll start to take a leak some morning and your pecko will come right off in your hand. That was startling information. The boys looked at one another. Mine better not, Pete Spettle said darkly. He was not enjoying himself in town so far, apart from the miracle of being handed ten dollars by Gus. Why, that's a leg pull, Jimmy Rainey said. How could one come off? Oh, well, if it don't come plumb off, it'll drip worse than my stomach, Lippy said. You boys oughtn't to doubt me. I was living with horrors before any of you sprouted. How do we get the beer? Newt asked. He was almost as intrigued by the thought of beer as by the thought of horrors. He had never quite dared go in a saloon for fear the captain would walk in and find him. Oh, I'll get you the beer, Lippy said. Got any cash? The boys looked at one another, reluctant to reveal the extent of their riches, lest Lippy tried to exploit them in some way. Fortunately, they had nearly three dollars over and above what Gus had given them. They shook out the small change and handed it to Lippy. They knew that drinking was something required of all real cowboys, and they were hot to try it. Will this get much? Newt asked. Hell, will a frog hop? Lippy said. I can get you plenty of beer and a bottle of whiskey to chase it. Lippy was as good as his word. In ten minutes he was back with plenty of beer and a quart of whiskey. He had a twinkle in his eyes, but the boys were all so excited by the prospect of drinking that they didn't notice. Lippy gave them the liquor and immediately started up the street. Where are you going? Newt asked. The barber says there's a drummer with an accordion staying in the hotel, Lippy said. If he ain't too attached to the accordion, I might buy it. We could make some fine music back at the wagon if we had an accordion to play. You ought to buy a new hat, Jimmy Rainey said boldly for Lippy was still wearing the disgraceful bowler he had worn in Lonesome Dove. That hat looks like it was et by a heifer that had the green slobbers, Newt said, feeling proud of his wit. Lippy was out of hearing by then, so the wit was wasted. The beer wasn't, however. Feeling that it was not appropriate to drink right out on the main street, the boys took their liquor around to the back of the livery stable and fell to. At first they sipped cautiously, finding the beer rather bitter but the more they drank, the less bothered they were by the bitter taste. Let's sample the whiskey, Ben Rainey suggested. The suggestion was immediately adopted. After the cool beer, the whiskey tasted like liquid fire, and its effects were just as immediate as fire. By the time he had three long swigs of the whiskey, Newt felt that the world had suddenly changed. The sun had been sinking rapidly as they drank, but a few swallows of whiskey seemed to stop everything. They sat down with their backs against the wall of the livery stable and watched the sun hang there, red and beautiful, over the brown prairie. Newt felt it might be hours before it disappeared. He swigged a couple of bottles of beer and felt himself getting lighter. In fact, he felt so light he had to put his hands on the ground every once in a while. He felt like as if he might float away, he might float up to where the sun was hanging. It was amazing that a few swallows of liquid could produce such a sensation. It was silly, 
but after a while he felt like lying down and hugging his stomach and hugging the earth to make sure he didn't float off. Young Jimmy Rainey turned out to have no stomach for liquor at all. He started vomiting almost as soon as he started drinking. Pete Spettle drank freely, but only looked darker and more depressed, whereas Ben Rainey enjoyed the liquor hugely and guzzled considerably more than his share. In no time, it seemed, they had finished off the beer. Somehow the sun had slipped on down while no one was looking, and the afterglow was dying. Stars were already out, and the four of them were just sitting behind a livery stable, drunk, and no closer to the horrors than they had been when they first came to town. Newt decided it wouldn't do. He stood up and found that he didn't float off, though when he tried to walk he found it no simple matter to put his feet down one after the other. It irritated him a bit, for he had never experienced any trouble in walking before, and felt a resentment against his feet for behaving so peculiarly. Still, he could make progress in some fashion, and he started boldly for the back stairs of the saloon. I'm going to meet one at least, he said. He kept walking, fearing that if he stopped, the whole project might slide to a halt. The others picked themselves up and began to follow, Ben Rainey bringing the whiskey bottle. This was unnecessary because it was empty. Newt made the stairs with no trouble and clomped right on up them. He had not really meant to seize the lead, and his heart was in his throat. He felt delicately balanced, as if his stomach might be in his throat too if he didn't proceed carefully. The stairs had seemed long and steep from the bottom, but in a second he found himself standing at the top. The door was slightly ajar, and he saw that someone was there. All he could see was a large shape. Then, before he could speak, he saw a woman with almost no clothes on come out of a room behind the shape. The woman's legs were naked, a sight so startling that Newt couldn't believe he was seeing it. "'Who is it, Buff?' the girl with the naked legs asked. "'I guess the cat's got his tongue,' the shape said in a husky voice. "'He ain't introduced himself.' "'I'm Newt.' he said, feeling uncertain suddenly about the whole enterprise. The other boys were just making their way up the stairs. The shape, it was a woman too, stepped half out the door and surveyed the group on the stairs. She was a large woman, and she smelled rather like P.I. had after he came out of the barber shop. Newt saw to his astonishment that her legs were naked too. It's a troop of little fellers, she said to her companion in the hall. They must have just let out school. They better get on in here while we ain't busy then, her friend said. That is, if they can afford it. Oh, we got money, Newt volunteered. We come up with a herd and we just got paid. I didn't know cowboys come this young, the big woman said. Show me the money. Newt pulled out his gold piece and the woman leaned in the hall to look at it under the light. I take it all back, she said to her friend. It's a bunch of rich cattlemen. Newt noticed that she didn't give him back his gold piece, but he didn't feel he ought to say anything. Maybe it cost ten dollars just to get in the door of a place where women went naked. The large woman held the door open, and he went past her, taking care not to stumble, for his feet were feeling more and more untrustworthy. The other boys sidled in after him. They found themselves standing in a bare hall, being stared at by the two women. This is Mary, and I'm buff the large woman said. Her ample bosom seemed to Newt to be about to burst out of the gown she wore. In the light it was clear that she was not very old herself, but she was large. The other girl, by comparison, seemed thin as a rail. This one's paid, Buff said, putting a hand casually on Newt's shoulder. I hope you other fellers are as rich as he is, otherwise you're welcome to pile back down those stairs. The Rainy Boys immediately produced their money, but Pete Spettle held back. He put his hand in his pocket, but instead of bringing out his money, he brought his hand out empty and turned for the door without a word. They heard him clump back down the stairs. These two look like brothers, Buff said, quickly sizing up the Rainy Boys. You take them, Buff, Mary said. I'll take the one that come in first. Well, maybe you will and maybe you won't, Buff said. I seen him first. I ought to have dibs. Newt almost began to wish he had followed the example of Pete Spettle. It was a hot night and close in the hall. He felt he might be sick. Also, from listening to the conversation, 
he realized they were the two horrors Dish had described. The big one was the buffalo heifer, and the other one was the one Dish said treated him nice. The buffalo heifer still had her large hand on his shoulder as she looked the group over. She had a black tooth right in front of her mouth. Her large body seemed to give off waves of heat like a stove, and the toilet water she wore was so strong it made him queasy. We got the whole night to get through, Mary said. We can't waste too much of it on these tadpoles. She took Ben Rainey's hand and quickly led him into a little room off the hall. Mary gets the fidgets if something ain't happening every minute, Buff said. Come on, Newt. Jimmy Rainey didn't like being left in the hall all by himself. Who do I do? he asked plaintively. Just stand there like a post, Buff said. Mary's quick, especially with tadpoles. She'll get you in a minute. Jimmy stood where he was, looking forlorn. She led Newt into a small room, with nothing much in it but an iron bedstead and a small wash basin on a tiny stand. A small, unlit coal oil lamp with no shade over the wick sat on a window sill. The window was open and the rim of the prairie still red, as if a line of coals had been spread along it. Come far? Buff asked in a husky voice. Yes, ma'am, from Texas, Newt said. Well, skin them pants off, Texas, she said, and to his astonishment unbuttoned three buttons of the front of her gown and pitched it on the bed. She stood before him naked, and since he was too startled to move, reached down and unbuckled his pants. The problem with cowboys is all the time it takes to get their boots off, she confided, as she was unbuttoning his pants. I don't get paid for watching cowboys wrestle with their dern boots, so I just leave the sheets off the bed. If they can't shuck them quick, they have to do it with them on. Meanwhile, she had unbuttoned his pants and reached for his Peter, which, once it was freed, met her halfway at least. Newt couldn't get over how large she was. She would easily make two of him. I doubt you've had a chance to get much, but it won't hurt to check, she said. She led him to the window and lit the coal oil lamp. The movement of her large breasts threw strange shadows on the wall. To Newt's surprise, she poured a little water on his Peter. Then she lathered her hands with a bar of coarse soap and soaped him so vigorously that before he could stop himself, he squirted right at her. He was horrified, sure that what he had done was a dreadful breach of decorum, far worse than not being able to get his boots off quickly. Of course, he had seen boys jerk at themselves, and he had done it plenty. But having a woman use soap and water on it brought matters to a head much quicker than was usual. Buff merely chuckled, exposing her black tooth. I forgot you tadpoles are so randy you can't tolerate a soaping, she said, wiping him off on a piece of sacking. She walked over to the bed and lay back on the corn shuck mattress, which crackled in protest. Come on, try it, she said. You might have another load yet. Should I take my boots off first? Newt said, feeling hopelessly inexperienced and afraid of making another mistake. No, nah, quick as you are, it ain't worth the effort, Buff said, scratching herself indelicately. You got a pretty good one on still. He knelt between her thighs, and she grasped him and tried to pull him in, but he was too far away. Flop over here. You ain't gonna do no good down there at the foot of the bed, she said. You spent ten dollars, you ought to at least try. Some girls would charge you ten just to soap you up, but Mary and me, we're fair. Newt allowed himself to be directed and made entrance, but then to his embarrassment he slipped out. He tried to reinsert himself, but couldn't find the spot. Buff's belly was huge and slippery. Newt got dizzy again and felt himself sliding off it. Again he had the sensation that he might fall off the earth, and he grasped her arms to stop himself. The buffalo heifer was unperturbed by his wigglings. You'll have to come back next time you draw your wages, she said. Pull up your pants and send in that other tadpole. As Newt got off the bed, he remembered Lorena suddenly. This was what she had done during all those months at the dry bean with any man who had drawn his wages. He felt a terrible regret that he hadn't had the ten dollars then, Though the buffalo heifer had not been unfriendly, he would far rather have had Lorena soap him up, though he knew he probably wouldn't have had the nerve to go in if it had been Lorena. Is it just the two of you? he asked, buttoning his pants. He had built up a certain curiosity about Mary, 
and despite all his embarrassments, decided he might try to visit her if he ever got another ten. Me and Mary, Buff said, I get the ones that like em fat, and she gets the ones that like em skinny. And if it's a feller who likes em either way, it's just a matter of who ain't busy at the time. She was still lying naked on the bed. I'll go get Jimmy, he said. When he opened the door, Jimmy was not more than a foot away. Probably he had been listening, which Newt resented. But in the dim hall, Jimmy looked too sick to be mad at. Your turn, Newt said. Jimmy went in, and Newt clumped down the stairs and found Pete Spettle waiting at the bottom. Why'd you leave? Newt asked. Told Ma I'd save my money, Pete said. I wish we had some more beer, Newt said. Though his experience with the buffalo heifer had been mostly embarrassing as it was happening, he did not feel disappointed. Only the fact that he was down to a quarter in cash kept him from going back in and trying his luck with Mary. For all the peculiarity of what was happening, it was powerfully interesting. The fact that it cost ten dollars hardly mattered to him, but it turned out that he was the only one who took that attitude. Ben Rainey came down the stairs just behind him, complaining about how overpriced the experience was. I doubt it took a minute once she got me washed, he said. Jimmy Rainey soon followed and was totally silent about his own experience. He was not over his upset stomach and kept falling behind to vomit as they walked around town looking for Lippy. Hell, horrors make a sight more than cowboys, Ben kept saying. It seemed to trouble him a good deal. We don't make but thirty dollars a month, and them two made thirty dollars off us in about three minutes. It would have been forty if Pete hadn't backed out. To Newt, such an argument seemed wide of the point. What the horrors sold was unique. The fact that it exceeded top-hand wages didn't matter. He decided he would probably be as big a horror as Jake and Mr. Gus when he grew up and had money to spend. They found Lippy by the sound of the accordion, which he had managed to purchase but had not exactly learned to play. He was sitting on the steps of the saloon with the big rack of elk horns over it, trying to squeeze out Buffalo Gal to an audience of one mule skinner and Alan O'Brien. The Irishman was wincing at Lippy's fumbling efforts. He'll never get the hang of it, the mule skinner said. It sounds like a darn mule whinnying. I just bought this accordion, Lippy said. I'll learn to play it by the time we hit Montani. Yeah, and if them Sioux catch you, you'll be squealing worse than that music box, the mule skinner said. Alan O'Brien kindly bought the boys each a beer. Though it was well after dark, people were still milling in the streets of Ogallala. At one point, they heard gunshots, but no one cared to go investigate. One beer was sufficient to make Jimmy Rainey start vomiting all over again. As they were riding back to the herd, Newt felt a little sad. There was no telling when he would get the chance to visit another whorehouse. He was riding along, wishing he had another ten dollars, when something spooked their horses. They never knew what, although Pete Spettle thought he might have glimpsed a panther. At any rate, Newt and Ben were thrown before they knew what was happening, and Pete and Jimmy were carried off into the darkness by their frightened mounts. What if it was Indians? Ben suggested when they picked themselves up. It was bright moonlight, and they could see no Indians, but both drew their pistols anyway, just in case, and crouched down together as they listened to the depressing sound of their horses running away. There was nothing for it but for them to walk to camp on foot, their pistols ready. Too ready, really, for Ben almost shot his brother when Jimmy finally came back to see about them. Where's Pete? Newt asked, but Jimmy didn't know. Jimmy's horse would ride double but not triple, so Newt had to walk the last two miles, annoyed with himself for not having kept a grip on the reins. It was the second time he had been put afoot on the drive, and he was sure everyone would comment on it the next day. But when he arrived, his horse was grazing with the rest of the remuda, and only Poe Campo was awake to take notice. Poe seemed to sleep little. Whenever anyone came in from a watch, he was usually up, slicing beef or freshening his coffee. Have you had a good walk? he asked, offering Newt a piece of cold meat. Newt took it, but discovered once he sat down that he was too tired to eat. He went to sleep with a hunk of beef still in his hand. Chapter 87 Clara was upstairs when she saw the four riders. 
She had just cleaned her husband. The baby was downstairs with the girls. She happened to glance out a window and see them, but they were still far away on the north side of the plat. Any approaching rider was something to pay attention to in that country. In the first years, the sight of any rider scared her and made her look to see where Bob was, or be sure a rifle was handy. Indians had been known to dress in white men's clothes to disarm unwary settlers, and there were plenty of white men in the territory who were just as dangerous as Indians. If she was alone, the sight of any rider caused her a moment of terror. But through the years, they had been so lucky with visitors that Clara had gradually ceased to jump and take fright at the sight of a rider on the horizon. Their tragedies had come from weather and sickness, not attackers. But the habit of looking close had not left her, and she turned with a clean sheet in one hand and watched out her window as the horseman dipped off the far slopes and disappeared behind the brush along the river. Something about the riders struck her. Over the years, she had acquired a good eye for horses, and also for horsemen. Something about the men coming from the north struck a key in her memory, but struck it so weakly that she only paused for a moment to wonder who it could be. She finished her task and then washed her face, for the dust was blowing and she had gotten gritty coming back from the lots. It was the kind of dust that seemed to sift through your clothes. She contemplated changing blouses, but if she did that, the next thing she knew she would be taking baths in the morning and changing clothes three times a day like a fine lady, and she didn't have that many clothes, or consider herself that fine. So she made do with a face wash and forgot about the riders. July and Cholo were both working the lots and would no doubt notice them too. Probably it was just a few army men wanting to buy horses. Red Cloud was harrying them hard, and every week two or three army men would show up wanting horses. It was one of those who had brought July the news about his wife, although of course the soldier didn't know it was July's wife when he talked about finding the corpses of the woman and the buffalo hunter. Clara had been washing clothes and hadn't heard the story, but when she went down to the lots a little later, she knew something was wrong. July stood by the fence white as a sheet. Are you sick? she asked. Cholo had ridden off with the soldier to look at some stock. No, ma'am he said in a voice she could barely hear. At times, to her intense irritation, he called her ma'am, usually when he was too upset to think. It's Ellie, he added. That soldier said the Indians killed a woman and a buffalo hunter about sixty miles east of town. I have no doubt it was her. They were traveling that way. Come on up to the house, she said. He was almost too weak to walk and was worthless for several days, faint with grief over a woman who had done nothing but run away from him or abuse him almost from the day they married. The girls were devoted to July by this time, and they nursed him constantly, bringing him bowls of soup and arguing with one another over the privilege of serving him. Clara let them, though she herself felt more irritated than not by the man's foolishness. The girls couldn't understand her attitude and said so. His wife got butchered up, Ma, Betsy protested. I know that, Clara said. You look so stern, Sally said. Don't you like July? I like July a lot, Clara said. He thinks you're mad at him, Betsy said. Why would he care, Clara said with a little smile. He's got the two of you to pamper him. You're both nicer than I've ever been. We want you to like him, Betsy said. She was the more direct of the two. I told you I like him, Clara said. I know people ain't smart and often love those who don't care for them. Up to a point, I'm tolerant of that. Then past a point, I'm not tolerant of it. I think it's a sickness to grieve too much for those who never cared a fig for you. Both of the girls were silent for a time. You remember that, Clara said. Do your best if you happen to love a fool. You'll have my sympathy. Some folks will preach that it's a woman's duty never to quit once you make a bond with a man. I say that's folly. A bond has to work two ways. If a man don't hold up his end, there comes a time to quit. She sat down at the table and faced the girls. July was outside, well out of hearing. July don't want to face up to the fact that his wife never loved him, she said. She ought to have loved him, Sally said. 
Ought don't count for as much as a gnat when you're talking about love, Clara said. She didn't. You seen her. She didn't even care for Martin. We've already given July and Martin more love than that poor woman ever gave them. I don't say that to condemn her. I know she had her troubles, and I doubt she was often in her right mind. I'm sorry she had no more control of herself to run off from her husband and child and get killed. She stopped to let the girls work on the various questions a little. It interested her, which they would pick as the main point. We want July to stay, Betsy said finally. You'll just make him run off being so stern, and then he'll get butchered up too. You think I'm that bad? Clara asked with a smile. You're pretty bad, Betsy said. Clara laughed. You'll be just as bad if you don't reform, she said. I got a right to my feelings too, you know. We're doing a nice job of taking care of July Johnson. It just gripes me that he let himself be tromped on and can't even figure out that it wasn't right and that he didn't like it. Can't you just be patient, Sally said. You're patient with Daddy. Daddy got his head kicked, Clara said. He can't help how he is. Did he keep his bond? Betsy asked. Yes, for sixteen years, Clara said, although I never liked his drinking. I wish he'd get well, Sally said. She had been her father's favorite and grieved over him the most. Ain't he going to die? Betsy asked. I fear he will, Clara said. She had been careful not to let that notion take hold of the girls, but she wondered if she was wrong. Bob wasn't getting better and wasn't likely to. Sally started to cry, and Clara put her arms around her. Anyway, we have July, Betsy said. If I don't run him off, Clara said. You just better not, Betsy said, eyes flashing. He might get bored and leave of his own accord, Clara volunteered. How could he get bored? There's lots to do, Sally said. Don't be so stern with him, Ma, Betsy pleaded. We don't want him to leave. It won't hurt the man to learn a thing or two, Clara said. If he plans to stay here, he'd better start learning how to treat women. He treats us fine, Sally pointed out. You ain't women yet, Clara said. I'm the only one around here, and he better spruce up if he wants to keep on my good side. July soon returned to work, but his demeanor had not greatly improved. He had little humor in him and could not be teased successfully, which was an irritant to Clara.